Well, good morning um, to some. It may be good morning to others. <laughs> it may be a different uh, time zones. Um, we are very excited to start uh, this session on the Internet of Things uh, with uh, participating in this uh, session. Uh, John Cook, Yoshiki uh, Shusha, Shusha, Sushil Sujari, hopefully joining us, and Todd Taylor. Um, and yes, there she is. Welcome, uh, Cecile. Happy that you could make it. Yeah. And um, well, much debated uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, but what about uh, security? How will it develop? How do we go from here? Um, and uh, what are the complications if you look at healthcare, commerce, travel? Um, the uh, financial services, in the insurance, the educational sector, which is uh, something uh, I'm very interested in as well myself, but also uh, looking at uh, Internet of Things and sustainability, uh, circular economy. What are the possibilities and as Internet of Things can either be an enabler, but can also be a polluter. So how are we going to make sure that it adds to sustainability? More of this during this session. Uh, I would like to give uh, our distinguished uh, speakers a, uh, the time to have a one minute introduction of themselves. Uh, and uh, Yushiji, uh, could you start? Shiki. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Yoshiki Sasaki from Japan. Um, as CEO, I'm uh, managing a group of companies doing uh, home health care, uh, creating digital platforms for that. And also we are really doing the service for more than 7,000 home patients in Japan. And also we are doing startup acceleration, uh, which have several different functions. And the so uh, these two are my main businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshiki. Uh, John, can I give you the floor? Sure. I'm John Cook. I'm based in Zurich. I'm. Uh, I look at the camera. I'm. Um, I'm from the U.S. and uh, been in Europe for the past 42 years. Um, uh, I'm chairman of a company called Rock Lake Advisors, which does capital raising and investing in technology and in private equity and venture capital. We've been at this for about 20 years. Uh, and um, we're seeing a lot more uh, innovation in uh, in IoT and in uh, internet, uh, particularly here in Switzerland. There's a big movement in, uh, in blockchain and cryptocurrency, Crypto Valley. Look forward to joining the panel. Thank you, John. Trushil, please. Hi. Hey, uh, sorry I was late for the panel, but uh, uh, glad to see you all guys. I'm Sushil. I'm the founder CEO of Travelex uh, and board member at Infinity Chains. Uh, at Travelex, we, I'm a serial entrepreneur. My previous company was acquired by Pandora in the US market. I worked at Microsoft before that. Uh, in my current job, we work with airports, malls, where we help them uh, have a better passenger experience with the help of IoT devices, as well as uh, combining retail, uh, passenger journey at the airport, all of them together to create a wonderful experience. So Thank you, Shishi. Thank you. Todd. It's good to be with you all. Good to be with this uh, great group of uh, panelists as well. I'm a professor of technology and supply chain at the Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University here in the U.S. And uh, no, it's a thrill for me to be here. I come out of industry. I come out of HP and IBM, where I spent almost 30 years of my career uh, working and uh, started the blockchain research lab here at Arizona State University and taught one of the first uh, courses to computer science and MBA students uh, on blockchain back uh, eight years ago. So have been working with uh, blockchain as a platform for several, several years and have a couple of startups in the healthcare space, in the uh, product track and trace uh, area, and uh, and also a project around digital identity, which uh, becomes relevant in the IoT space as well. So look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Todd. So let's get it started. And uh, Yoshiki, I, I would like to ask you to kick off, and I'm sure you will touch upon also uh, uh, the issue, do we actually 
um, have an, let's say, is communication fast enough to uh, to uh, to do all the things we uh, we would like to do with the Internet of Things and really exploit all the opportunities it has? But um, I give the floor to you. Okay, then uh, if we talk about the interaction, which is a communication, and then there is the two different tiers, machine to machine, machine to people, and people to people. And the, then if we talk about the people to people, which is uh, very, could, can become a very high level of communication, and uh, it is always the information is lacking relative to the physical meeting. And therefore, uh, if we have a more bandwidth, then we could have more information of what we are interacting. And that uh, especially have, uh, works for healthcare services. And the doctors see the patient, and there is a very subtle information from the patient which doctor to sense, which is not really possible at this moment. And telemedicine is, I mean, going but this is a very preliminary stage on the market. <coughs> so uh, I think uh, this uh, trend is very welcoming to our industry. Oh. And, and also in the startup acceleration, we need a very close communication with the management, which is also, again, we need a lot of information in between. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Shiki. Uh, John. Could you shed your light on your insights, your experience with IoT? Yeah, I, I was going to just give a couple of comments on the market. I look at it often from a, an, a venture capital and, and investor's perspective. Um, just a couple of benchmark points. Uh, in in uh, 2022, there was about $120 billion spent on the IT industry, on, on the IoT industry. Uh, there's, it's growing at 11 and a half percent. So it's, uh, three, four times, uh, GDP growth, depending on your country. Um, and the industrial IOT sector alone attracted 2 billion in, in, uh, new investments in venture capital investments, not including corporate in, uh, in 2021. Um, the opportunities are, are, you know, absolutely enormous as this whole sector fits into the industrial, the fourth industrial revolution, which is a big. Uh, trend, a big uh, topic for Thunderbird School and, and uh, Arizona State University. And um, just a couple of benchmark points. Um, the five most active uh, corporate venture funds in IoT. Uh, the top one was uh, Cisco. Cisco Investments and has invested since 1993 300, 300 million in 80 transactions. Intel Capital uh, has invested 300 million in 146 transactions. Google Ventures, 250 transactions, but they don't say how much. Uh, GE, GE Ventures, 150 million in 60 transactions. And Qualcomm, uh, 500 million in 100 companies. So th these are some of the more, uh, the more active uh, venture fr firms. And in terms of verticals, I could offer that ag tech is a very big area. Uh, a leading company there is Silent Herdsman, who just raised 4 million. Um, smart waste is another vertical. Uh, Enovo just raised 12 million. Uh, smart factories and smart homes uh, is, a, is a, a big area. Consumer wearables and then travel and transport. And I know TravelX is just in the, on the verge of raising 5 million. Um, so I'll just stop there. There's a couple of comments as an overview of the market. Thank you, uh, John, for this overview. Uh, Sushil, could you shed your light on IoT? Sure. So, uh, firstly, as TravelX, we work with airports to create a better passenger experience, create operation efficiency, passenger, uh, basically optimizing the passenger journey through the airport, both from uh, the passenger satisfaction as well as energy efficiency and infrastructure efficiency from that point of view. So we see IoT being used in two or three different areas at the airport itself. There are, there are a lot more, but at least what we interact with. The first one is IoT is used to see at any given time at, at let's say, Heathrow Airport in London, <clears throat> there are probably 20,000 passengers. A, a terminal might carry, you know, each terminal has a capacity of probably 800 passengers, 1,000 passengers, right? They have to, for, so 
the 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 for optimizing the operational efficiency of how many trains or should there be more trains shuttling between terminals uh, <clears throat> so they need to know where exactly the passengers are so what they what the airports usually deploy are these iot sensors heat sensors which tells them how many people are in which terminal they can you can put sensors for how long is the queue for security how long is my baggage check in queue for american airlines how long is my immigration queue right and they can increase the number of uh, counters or increase or decrease the number of counters based on that right and we help them do that with our, some of our partners we feed the data that come out, comes out of this iot and we say we tell the we alert the passenger ahead of time that there is going to be a long security queue so you should get going for the gate or you should leave your home early because you want to catch a 9 o'clock flight and it's going to take 30 minutes for the security itself right so things like that so how do we uh, make the stressful experience of an airport with the help of iot and other and our uh, and customer facing tools like ours to improve the passenger experience that's number one uh the second one that we see at airport is energy efficiency as we we all know airports are huge uh in terms of size square footage uh per, and they all require air conditioning but uh, it can be and then today uh, but the way they were built and some of the older airports they they were homogeneous in terms of how the air conditioner the entire uh, hall of air conditioner was uh, uh, the entire terminal was air conditioned now what uh they are calling it dynamic temperature control and air conditioning where depending on the number of passengers who are there at the terminal at that time they are basically pumping up the the power of the air conditioner or lower right uh, same with uh, some of the lighting and other areas right? uh so these are the two areas that we know at travelex there are a lot more like you know how the hangar is managed how the plane uh the operational efficiency of a gate is managed in terms of when the flight takes off and all Uh, but yeah we are aware and we are actively working on these two areas thank you uh, shushil tod could you no you those right? yeah thanks desray those are eight uh, use cases you know my i come at this from a supply chain standpoint my uh, my career has been largely in the area of supply chain so you know logistics and transportation and measuring and monitoring uh, heat and humidity on food and pharmaceutical products um is was my initial exposure to um some of these technologies and RFID in particular uh being able to sense humidity um and other things which has some uh home healthcare applications as well that uh, I'm sure Yoshiki uh, has experimented with but um you know the the ability that we have now to sense um and report from these disparate devices and sensors really creates for us a challenge that we saw you know many years ago in manufacturing execution systems where you've just got a deluge of data now that you have to be able to make useful right so um you know being able to uh apply advanced analytics and artificial intelligence and machine learning to the data that is being produced by these uh sensors and devices is really um how I was introduced to this uh to this area and and I'm just yeah you know, really excited about not just the connectivity that's enabling and the the number of devices that are being deployed but also the tools and technologies that we have to help make sense of the data and to help filter through the data that is of most importance and can provide insights and actionable um understanding and 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 learning for us to then to then take action upon so uh, my work with blockchain actually really stemmed from an experiment we were doing back in the back in 2012 around device to device and sensor communications and can we can we find a platform or create a platform to manage interactions and collaboration and mm-hmm. transactions uh between devices without any manual intervention and that's when one of the engineers stumbled across the bitcoin code base as something that may work for this autonomous device collaboration so um not only are we seeing improvements in the devices themselves in the amount of memory they can hold in how broadly they can uh communicate information that they may be collecting uh, the power of the readers um etc but also we're seeing 
uh, great advances in the technologies that allow uh, more autonomous uh, compute and transaction and interaction between those devices and the, the filtering of information um, that, uh, that advanced analytics and artificial intelligence can bring to the table. So, yeah, exciting times. Yeah, thank you, Todd. Now, um, a lot of uh, opportunities, possibilities, a lot of hallelujah about Internet of Things. But, John, um, do you have an idea why it's not developing faster? If you listen to all the opportunities there are, why is it not developing faster? <clears throat> uh, that's a very good question. Actually, I would say it's already developing pretty darn fast. Uh, there's a lot of money, billions that's going into IoT, but I guess if you look at it from sort of a society, uh, Earth, planet, sustainability standpoint, uh, it could not come, it could, it could come faster. Um, we need, there's a lot of problems in the world and we need solutions and technology is the solution uh, back to the fourth industrial revolution and the digital transformation that's going on. Um, some of the constraints that I think uh, that Todd can certainly speak more about is speed of the devices, speed of communications. Uh, that's uh, constantly in development. Cost is another factor, although that has a double side to it because cost brings down uh, cost bring down the, the, the delivery of services at better at better cost. But the cost, for example, in supply chain these days is going up because people just can't buy things here in Zurich. During the COVID, it would, it would take uh, three months to order a, a new uh, I, iPad uh, because of the, the, so another is uh, is security. And again, uh, Todd can probably address this security from the, the security that's, that's provided by blockchain in this whole digital transformation. And that has to continue to go through further, further research. Education, just teaching people how to use and how to identify areas of need if there was better education across the masses, and, and I know Thunderbird now has a new course to teach, a new program to train 100 million learners across the world in, in digital uh, technologies. And then scaling is another area, I would say, just the ability of, of uh, the manufacturing base around the world to step up the, the, the scaling and, 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 and manufacture, create, design, manufacture uh, devices and connectivity at scale. Um, in agriculture and medical and all the different verticals that are using. So those are those are some areas I would say that, you know, we have a need to be able to roll this technology out at a faster scale. Yeah. And uh, Yoshiki, if you I think there is so much we can learn from Japan, at least in the Netherlands, we very much look to Japan also in terms of healthcare. How far are we from really smart healthcare systems that's not only for, uh, let's say, the <coughs> but also for the patients. I think that, that they really um, sort of um, get the advantage of what IoT can offer with the wearables, preventive healthcare. How far are we from really having that rolled out? I think uh, it takes some time. Uh, that's uh, not mainly because of the technology, but because of the perception of the people working in this industry. And for example, uh, the the people in the uh, medical area just believe in the real thing. Of course, that is slightly changing, uh, like a rob robotics operational machine, for example, that could later be extended to a sort of a remote, uh, say, acceptance of remote operations. But uh, this uh, is the biggest hurdle for both for patients and doctors and nurses or caregivers or these people, uh, they are not, uh, I mean, uh, accustomed to use these tools. So the tools need to be more friendly to for these people who do not understand the the basics of the IT. It has to be a sort of humanization of technologies needed. Humanization of to penetrate. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's also kind of training, uh, where John also referred to. Uh, education is an important one. Then it's both uh, both sides. The technology, yeah. uh, the engineer need to imagine uh, what is done at the real 
I mean, real situation of uh, mm-hmm. diagnosis or thera- therapeutic actions, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Now, so, uh, John also referred to uh, one of the issues being security. Uh, Todd, uh, what are, in your view, let's say the top three issues when we look at security and what, what should be done in order to make that, um, yeah, to respond to the challenges, the security challenges that IoT brings? I mean, the secure challenges are legitimate. I, I just want to loop back to Yoshiki just for a second because I'm just really curious about the 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 healthcare um, identity uh, you know we, there's all this talk around wellness and holistic wellness identities for individuals right. and you know one of the promises of IoT is if we can pull all of this data together from our wearable device from our medical records from our health history from our DNA from our uh, mRNA sequence from you know, all of these different pieces of data that we have not consolidated today into a single record so that we can then interrogate that record with analytics, right? Um, I, I appreciate your comment, Yoshiki, about uh, maybe the elderly population or or other members of the population that just can't, won't ever be able maybe to interact in that way. But how do you see how do you see that evolving? Uh, the technology is kind of there to some degree, but how do you see mm-hmm. the the humanization aspect evolve, and how do you see an industry like yours adopting these capabilities? Mm-hmm. I think this is a trial and error of the real uh, real life situation. And for example, mm-hmm. if you become older, your acceptance level becomes narrower. So if you provide something, in most cases, they refuse, <laughs> for example. Therefore, yeah. uh, there need to be a cooperation between the provider and the receiver. So how to be accepted is one very big issue. And mm-hmm. also, if we talk about uh, medical data sharing, so to speak, this is a very delicate <coughs> information. So at the moment, we have a system that the doctor uh, a limited number of data can share the data of the patient. So this is legally possible, but right. we cannot tell this to the caregiver who are not uh, basically a prof- medical professional, for example. Therefore, we need to have a several levels of, uh, I mean, security, mm-hmm. or the secrecy, so speak, to right. share. And the, if we have a uh, integrated data, who, of course the individual is the owner of the data, but uh, who is going to secure that uh, security that is not leaked or used for other purposes? That is another yeah. issue. Yeah. I think our gener our our generation will really uh, be one of the generations that starts to adopt the use of you know, public and private keys, right? We, we need to become more accustomed to managing digital wallets, digital identities, uh, digital certificates, the provisioning, the securing of private keys and the provisioning of public keys. And that's one of the underlying uh, adoptions, honestly, that needs to take place, technology adoptions that needs to take place in order to make, you know, all of these all of these Web 3.0 or you know, Industry 4.0 kind of paradigms and technology take hold. You know, if we can't manage uh, a credential, a digital credential, uh, we can't move to to digital voting or decentralized voting mechanisms. We we can't move to uh, decentralized identity in our web experience. We can't move to this holistic wellness identity. We can't manage our own financial digital financial identity or career identity or student identity or whatever it may be right we've got to learn and and we have to start to adopt uh and and learn how to manage these uh digital credentials uh and and yes the security technologies i think are keeping are are keeping pace we have a whole bunch of you know quantum level security capabilities that even go beyond you know, the hashing and other kinds of security that takes place on, on our blockchain platforms. But, uh, you know, the whole paradigm shift from, 
you know, security from, from prevention and firewalls and, and, you know, isolation to now these zero trust security environments is certainly changing um, our approach and changing the way and the technologies that we're seeing and the architectures that we're using in order to protect and isolate uh, and identify and defend when, when breaches have occurred. So, um, yeah. Yes, there still is the prevention aspect, but there, uh, but there's also now you know you have to assume that it's gonna it, that that exposure is happening, and uh, and you've got to be able now to isolate and uh, and and operate in these zero trust uh, paradigms. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Sushil. Could you elaborate on your view on how IoT could contribute to sustainability um, and uh, circular economy? Because I think there is a world to win there as well. Um, what are your thoughts? So I'll speak about uh, in in two contexts. So the one, the airport one, I spoke about it. So sustainable is very important. So airports are are carbon guzzlers in a way. You know, if you look at the carbon footprint of airports, it's, it's really bad and, and they have to be because just the sheer number of people that are that are traveling through the airports uh, is, is just enormous. It's one of the you can think of the most busiest. It's busier than some of the biggest malls in the world, right, in a way. Uh, so for them, it is very important to to have some kind of optimization around energy usage and carbon footprint. The way it is done today is, of course, you know, they, they are using solar, they've installed solar and, and they're trying to use the green energy as much as possible. But uh, I think <clears throat> optimizing anything from uh, basically, can you imagine that an airport parking lot can itself be a, a gas guzzler if, if, if what you're driving, you don't know where to park, you'll keep on going round and round. If they, may, if they put a system there where you know exactly where the open spot is, you can in a year then claim that you you have saved probably half a million gas, you know, which a, a passenger would have then used to uh, uh, probably you know find the right parking spot for that matter. Right? Uh, the the electric vehicles that are used in the airport, right? Uh, where exactly are the vehicles, and where can I get into it so that I get to my gate at the right time? Uh, I think we spoke about the energy efficient usage of air conditioning. Uh, and uh, efficient use of, uh, you know, passenger handling, passenger queues, all of them, they help airports to reduce their overall consumption in, in a very big way. And I think uh, this is one industry that uh, we are aware of, but I'm sure similar applications are applicable uh, to, to, to all industries, maybe. Right? Uh, mm -hmm. So I think IoT is a big, uh, I know for a fact that once you install the energy efficiency IOTs, you could bring down the energy consumption by, by 15 percent, 15, 1, 5 percent by not doing anything else, but just installing this. And, and this is I'm talking about peak summer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so imagine uh, the carbon goals that we have taken, neutrality goals that we have taken. We can get there faster with the help of IOT. And I think uh, it's a big game changer, I should say, in that aspect. Mm -hmm. And and what about uh, the circular economy? Do you see any, um, yeah, what's happening in uh, in companies there? Do you have any idea? Uh, so in travel specifically, there is uh, in fashion. I've seen a lot of circular economy where uh, I'm involved in another company where circular is used. Uh, so there are tags which go on garments, right? Uh, so so circular is basically. Once you've used uh, the genes that you're using, finally, when it is done its lifetime, then it can be, uh, you know, regenerated and then shredded and bring bring back to life in, in the form of a raw material for another genes. Right? That's what circular is, at least in my understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. way to do that and, and um, efficiently. John, if you look at the flow of money for IoT, mm -hmm. um, where do you see most of the money is going? So are there any industries that attract more or any, uh, let's say, um, I do have some used cases where, where there is more than in other, is it more in healthcare or is it more <coughs> in travel or can you shed light on that from your experience? Do you have any information on that? Um, I, I think that uh, some examples of areas where I, where I think there's a lot more money going in. John, is, uh, um, I don't know whether it's just me. I can't hear you. 
Is my microphone off? No, we hear you fine, John. Hear you. Yeah, we hear you. I was coughing. Thanks, Todd. Uh, yeah. So those Sorry. areas no. that are more on the on the frontier of technology, and I and I uh, in the IoT space, I list specifically some a new term that's coming up, which is which is AIoT, artificial intelligence of things. So it's using not only uh, IoT like devices, edge devices, and uh, distributed dis devices and cloud connected to devices, but it's uh, using artificial intelligence in the in the uh, an analysis, you know, the analytics that go with that data, because that's where that's where where uh, companies and businesses can can um, really start to uh, to be be smarter about the data that they're collecting. The, the world is just is just now learning how to collect data and how to watch things by remote through all the devices. And that applies to all the industry sectors that we're, we're talking about here. Um, but also those, those sectors that are on the frontier of being, being able to marry together a AI and IoT, a AIoT. I would say those are, uh, and, and, and a good area there is uh, Tesla as an example. And, um, and uh, the, uh, the healthcare and remote um, remote healthcare uh, and surgical operations. I know in the MRI space, they're using AI in the cloud to be able to analyze um, billions and billions of images uh, that are put out by the, the, the growing number of MRI machines around the world uh, to be able to analyze and get uh, um, results, uh, diagnostics back to doctors and hospitals and patients in in record time in minutes rather than having to send uh images to radiologists who only work 20 hours a day to try to try to read all the images with an eye so ai is expected to take over about uh you know 80 percent to 90 percent of the radiology reading in the world in the next in the next uh five years we're working with a company in um, it's a spin out technology from Harvard and Yale and Columbia that's doing exactly this area. So I know a little bit more about it. Um, um, but that I, I'd say the, the money is looking for the more frontier, at least in the venture space. They're always looking for the uplift and the uplift comes from buying future growth. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and well, you mentioned before education, and Todd, uh, your university uh, is, I think, uh, uh, one of the first mover advantage to take that seriously, and uh, not by a small program, but uh, having a target of education in millions of people, I believe. So, can you shed light on that? How are you doing that? What are your targets? How do you see that? How should others? uh follow this example yeah thanks for bringing that up i mean it's a hundred million learner initiative so the the opportunity obviously or the the objective is to extend uh, higher education to a hundred million learners around the world and these obviously are learners who haven't traditionally had access to uh, university level education but being able to afford them and offer them a credentialed uh, learning experience uh, where ASU, Arizona State University, and the Thunderbird School of Global Management actually issues a certificate of course completion or a series of course uh, completions to the individual is really what we're, we're what we're about, and and it starts really with some of the fundamentals around finance and accounting and some of the basic operational um, disciplines. But it's really targeted to entrepreneurs and and uh, people who aspire to work in in business and give them kind of baseline credentials for them to then more fully participate in the global economy. So it's a very aggressive goal. But there is a, there was a very generous donation um, by a family uh, near and dear to uh, Thunderbird who has has extended a huge amount of money to make this a reality. And we're really grateful um, for them to them for this uh, contribution, and uh, really excited about the opportunity to extend this learning opportunity to the yeah people in in all parts of the world. Yeah, has it already one, started? Just one addition on that, Desiree. Just just one addition on it because both Todd and I are connected with Thunderbird. They expect seventy percent of that of the hundred million learners to be women. Nice. Mm. Yeah. 
And, uh, and has it already be, started, we'll, Todd? Has the we'll program be, we'll, already started? It's already started. In fact, we already have our first degree recipients um, through the program, and it's several thousand already. So it's mm -hmm. moving really quickly, and uh, we're really excited about it and happy with it. Each of these students will receive um, not only a physical um, certificate or diploma, but also a digital credential um, associated with their with their graduation or their their certificate. So talking about managing your own data. That's, yeah, exactly. That's a great example, right? Yeah, and exactly. uh, Yoshiki, if you look at healthcare, because obviously, if you would look at education there, it would be very specific, right? Because you need the professionals um, first, perhaps, and then also, um, or parallel to that uh, patient. But how do you see uh, education going that training of people because uh, right. basically mm. the success stands or falls with the education of people, right? As you mentioned. So how do you see that yes. developing? Yeah, for example, we have a, a education company in Indonesia. This is meant for the continued medical education for doctors. In Indonesia, there are 90,000 active doctors and at the moment we have uh, 15,000 working on our platform and this is for to get to get all these uh, working doctors to be uh, catching up to the present practices and the uh, also if we extend to the nursing or caregiving we, we in the near future we need to use all the, the very modern ways of communicating how to do that by using ARs, VRs, that sort of thing, mixed reality or that sort of thing. And which is still not cost uh, competitive, so to speak. Therefore, we need to run how to make the contents at a very competitive price. Yeah, and will that not, uh, um, I mean, the longer you um it takes probably uh once you have developed it i i assume that the first you know for developing costs are, are the highest and then the more people enroll in the program the costs go down or is that uh, 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 too easy is it is is uh, is that not the case that uh, once you have developed uh, it, I mean you can roll it out, right? Uh, easy, yes. or, or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, there are slight uh, differences depending on the different uh, legal and the social environment, mm. uh, yeah. because uh, the medical legislation is different country by country. Uh, yeah. yeah. So you, you need to fine tune all these contents to these areas, but. Basically, say 70, 80% is common. Yeah. So if we have uh, that sort of uh, accumulation of content, we can use that wisely. Yeah. Yeah. Shushil, uh, if you look at, um, you are very active in the travel industry. If you were to say, how could we enhance IoT in, in, in that industry to uh, roll it out, so, let's say in an even bigger manner than currently is. Um, huh? You said you work on two or three, focus on that uh, um, and important. You, you can't do it all. But how could adaptation uh, on a larger scale take place? You're mute. <laughs> no, he's on mute. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, so, uh, so great question. And I think this is as applicable in other domains as well. Uh, but I feel there has to be special recognition for airlines, airports, concessioners, or any aviation partner who are doing the right thing, right? And it cannot be just namesake trophy awards, but what are the, the financial incentives for these guys to, to be more consistent, to be more green, to be more sustainable, yeah. right? Uh, because any of these IoT systems, though they give you uh, probably the, uh, the long-term benefit, but in short term, it's a capital investment up front, right? Uh, yeah. So two things that I can think of is is uh, government supporting these kind of programs by either helping them, you know, uh, providing the capital for these initial capex investments. That's one. Or second, uh, I believe that there are these very specific IoT specific companies. If instead of a capex model, if the government can itself uh, EU 
or or the US government can come out and say, uh, you know, anywhere you deploy, the capex is going to be funded fifty uh, percent by the government itself, which will be recovered over a period of time, like a subscription model. And how do you help these IoT companies, which are in the sustainable space, to to be deployed in a in a subscription manner rather than having these companies to take the the uh, you know uh, the hit upfront? I think. Uh, I'm a strong believer that if there is financial incentives aligned, then the adoption can happen much faster than what is happening right now. So you so see here that... your role in the in the from the government. Uh, sorry, uh, John, you wanted to. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Israel. Yeah, no, I guess uh, I, so. Sushi is uh, referring to government, but I guess also venture capitalists uh, could play a role here, John. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um... But I wanted to add one thing to what Sushil just said. Uh, my company is working currently with a renewable energy company in the U.S. in Louisiana to, to uh, build uh, faster, smarter ammonia plants because ammonia would become a, a key uh, sustainable fuel in the future for shipping and, air, and airlines and aircraft. And um, one of the big incentives to allow to facilitate uh, constructing faster plants is ta tax credits, not only in the form of tax credits or offsets, but also cash rebates. And uh, the U.S. government, for example, is now stepping up their credits from 35 or $40 per, per ton of CO2 uh, taken out of the atmosphere and sequestered to $80 as a cash incentive. And that's going to facilitate a lot faster uh, building of, of uh, ammonia and methane um, uh, plants, which will help facilitate the sequestration of CO2. So the government, I think, can play a, a, a really huge role at, at pivotal times in the economy where we need to move things along fast. If you just look at China, China says we want to have something done. Boom, it's done. Uh, you know, building a highway, building a plot, building hospitals for COVID. Um, so they're, they're the biggest actor of all actors on the economic stage. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and they, but, but we all operate in a, in the, uh, free market economy, even governments operate in the free market economy. Right. So, yeah. so they, they need to figure out how to influence that, to be able to drive private sector, you know, CapEx and OpEx, uh, uh, requirements to get things moving faster that help solve crises that we're in, um, improve the delivery and efficiency and better, better lifestyles, things like that. Just to add yeah. to what the uh, well, and, and a huge opportunity to add instrumentation through these IOT technologies to that carbon credit allocation uh, system, right, John? I mean, so much that's happening today is just greenwashing, right? And it's carbon yeah. credit um, allocation <clears throat> just with really no, no fundamental uh, measurement or monitoring at all behind it. So being able to apply uh, this, this instrumentation uh, to help quantify really, you know, how much uh, carbon uh, a given piece of land is sequestering or a given instrument is sequestering or a given piece of land is, is releasing, right, is emitting. Um, we, we have some technologies and we've actually uh, secured a patent uh, through Thunderbird um, on that instrumentation and being able to use satellite data to look at the land and how much uh, carbon a given parcel of land can sequester. Mm -hmm. And we can do this now across broad landscapes. So hopefully we're working towards that future of a, of a much more quantitative uh, allocation of carbon, carbon, carbon credits. Yeah. Thank you. Just to add one final thing we have, yeah. we have, uh, we have uh, Yoshiki on the line and, and talking about Japan, both in the two areas that I'm currently pretty active in. Japan ranks up at the top of both in terms of MRI technology. They're the uh, per capita basis. They have most MRI machines, which is the best technology to know what's going on with the human body. And, and they're at the forefront of carbon sequestration and, and um, adoption of clean fuels. Japan, as a, a country that's got very technologically oriented and has a very, very uh, um, deterministic government, a futuristic looking to the future uh, government, if there's something coming along on down the pike that they see that would be of a benefit to their society, they put a lot of government effort into it. So they're at the top of many, many sectors. Yeah, I wanted to ask it to uh, uh, Yoshiki. The only thing is our time has elapsed. 
<laughs> you can right. stick around for a couple of more minutes, yeah. <laughs> because okay. I wanted to. We can communicate to through the mail. Yes. I yes. wanted to ask you. You're seeking exactly. You know what the Japanese told you. But our time has elapsed, so it is uh, nevertheless interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you all so much for participating and uh, it's been a joy uh Yoshiki, John, Todd, Trishil, to get to know you first of all and uh, and right. to uh, to have done this with you. Um, I hope it's going to be to the benefit of people who, uh, who will uh, watch this uh, perhaps after, um, sometime after it, as it has been recorded and will be sent uh, probably to uh, participants. I saw some participants, not many, but John already warned that... Uh, it, that usually is the case and that people also can watch it afterwards so uh, i think that's a good thing i would love to talk to uh, with you for hours because there's so many interesting <laughs> things going on that uh, uh, so i shall be looking for your names anywhere where there is iot <laughs> Yeah, as it's uh, in my mind, that's now for links forever to the, to the to the four of you. So thank you so much. Hope to see you again in one of these events. And it has been a share, real pleasure to. Uh, and apologies, Yoshiki. In the beginning, I I was just <laughs> trying. I don't know what happened. I have a brace. <laughs> It it really uh, fighted with me at the beginning. I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> yes, sir, you <laughs> you raised, and it didn't help to pronounce your name. <laughs> yes, sir, I want to congratulate you. You did a great job on moderating and steering this panel. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a, I don't thank know, you. great day, yeah. evening, evening <laughs> afternoon, uh, but whatever it is, enjoy it. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.